really a weird light in here. I can't figure it out. How are you guys doing today? I'm watching uh, Big Brother right now. Well, <clears throat> I'm getting caught up. I like. I'm reading the. I'm watching the uh, Vito Comp episode, but I like already read the spoilers, so like I don't really feel like I need to. Uh, I'm putting. I just film my videos. I don't really feel like I need to watch it, but because I already know what happened. Do you guys do that? It's so bad, isn't it? I shouldn't probably watch the spoilers, but I do. How about you? <laughs> what if like everything in life was a musical? <laughs> Look at her butt over there. Isn't that not so funny? <sighs> if you had to sing everything. <laughs> if your life were a musical, what would you call it? If my life were a musical, I would call it Crazy Town. Got my hair cut this morning. Don't she look nice? And then, it is like really hard to put this stuff away <laughs> while I am filming with one hand. But we aren't in a car, so we should be so happy about that. Oh. Blue skies. Okay. Everything's cleaned up. Everything's back to normal. It's, it's hard to like film you guys because you're like, <laughs> if you guys have a vlogging camera like this, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's like, you look right into it. Like it's a, a mirror. And so it's really hard. Look, Kevin's stuck on the thing right there. It's like a mirror, right? So it's like you're just like constantly wanting to fix your hair and do stuff. I used to think like with Tyler Oakley, I was like, why is he always fixing his hair? And now I totally understand it. So I got my hair cut, what do y'all think? She had it all pushed back like this. She goes, you look just like that guy with the, uh, the, the most interesting man in the world. I said, well, I am the most interesting man in the world. So, uh. Now that we know that, I said, no, um, he was about 75. Thank you. I'm 45. <laughs> True story. I think he's dead. I think he died, which is why there's no uh, Dos Equis commercials anymore. But if they're looking for a new Dos Equis guy, they should totally call me, don't you think? And then my ad would be, I don't drink, but if I did, I would drink Dos Equis. Could you guys contact Dos Equis and tell them that they should look at me because I am truly the most interesting man in the world? And then I would be like... I don't drink alcohol, but if I did, I would drink Dos Equis. <laughs> I think I'm gonna do some internet shopping tonight. Do we call it that? <laughs> I have some things I wanna purchase. And, um, you ever sit and you're like, is my phone ringing? Like, I can't tell if my phone's ringing or what? <laughs> and I wanna listen to, because I'm totally addicted to, I am listening to right now on Audible, um, Paula Hawkins, who wrote, see, this is not a good place for me to sit. Um, she wrote The Girl on the Train, and I'm reading her second one now, which is called Into the Water. Oh, my God. It is so good, you guys. It is like, it is modern day Agatha Christie. It is so, so, so good. I can't believe that last night I almost completely forgot to do my vlog at all. Like, totally. I think that's so funny. Anyway. <clears throat> I'm gonna let the puppies out and I'm gonna make some dinner and then I'm going to, yeah, rest for a little bit and I'm gonna do a live stream later, so. All right, you guys, I will see you later. Hello. Ugh, what a long day it has been. And it is hot and muggy. Do you ever just like get, like you just feel real uncomfortable? Like, I'm like really uncomfortable. It's hot and muggy. And I'm just like, ugh. And I like, have drank so much water today and I ate at like, okay, so Alex came home, we ate together at 8.30 and it is three and I still feel full. And I had that little macaroni and cheese thing that I eat most days that's like a little container. And then I had like hummus 
like and um this guacamole stuff and the scraps of like uh those pita bites that I had that was it not pita bites but pita chips to dip it in I mean I didn't have that much and I'm like why do I feel so full like it's the weirdest thing so anyway I don't know I'll probably wake up tomorrow and be four pounds heavier that's how it's been so my day's been okay I um I actually want to listen to my audiobook before I um, go to bed tonight. So this will probably not be real long, although I said that the other night and then it ended up being so long. I am, um, I'm listening to Into the Water by Paula Hawkins and it's fantastic. And if you guys want a really good mystery right now, it's a really good mystery. Like I can't wait to get in the car and listen to it. I typically don't listen to audiobooks during the day. I typically listen to music when I'm driving around. And, um, uh, since the last two days that I've been like reading this book or listening to it on Audible, I have like frantically been like listening to it all day long. And I went before I got um, in the car, I got um, on Audible, I had five credits. And so I bought, I think I bought four books because I wanted to save one credit in case I saw some book that I wanted to listen to while I was in um, Miami next week. And I was like, ugh say that because I want I get two more credits next week so it's like I constantly have all these credits and I'm I've been listening to a lot of books recently but um I bought Lily and the Octopus because Ricky sent it to me and said it was a fantastic book and um it's kind of like by about like, kind of like Art of Racing in the Rain which I loved Art of Racing in the Rain um but I heard that the audiobook was amazing so I'm gonna read I'm gonna listen to the audiobook and um, then I got The Gentleman's Guide to Whatever, because I'm doing a Buddy Reads with that. It's supposed to be really, really good. Um, uh, I'm doing a Buddy Reads with Tom Talks Books next month. So I got that, because I'm going to listen to it on Audible. And then I got Crooked Kingdom, which is a secret, the sequel to Six of Crows. Because I just finished Six of Crows, but it just danced off, and now I have to listen to the sequel and six of crows was 15 hours and 40 minutes and i thought that was long crooked kingdom is 18 hours i'm like seriously though so okay and then the fourth book i got was uh the late show by michael Connolly. i used to read a lot of michael Connolly. it's not something that i would typically read but he introduced this new female detective and it's like these prostitute murders that happen in like Hollywood. And I was like, okay, that would be a really good book to listen to on my vacation because I like to just kind of listen to something that I, have, I don't have to be real deep with, but I want to be like on the plane or like on the beach or by the pool and just be like completely engrossed and listening to like, you know, a book that I feel like I'm kind of like, I love to read mysteries and books that I kind of feel like I'm living as I'm reading it. Like that's why I really liked like back in the day, like James Patterson and um, David Baldacci. David Baldacci's book, The Winner, and the first two James Patterson books that I ever read, which were Kiss the Girls and Along Came a Spider, those two books, for me, were like, so all those three books were fantastic intros to those kind of authors. They don't really write like that anymore, you know? Like, I feel like they're kind of sellouts. They write on a formula. I know people love them, and I think you should read what you want to read. But it's like, for me, I just am not that enticed with them anymore. You know, James Patterson, like every chapter he writes is like a page and a half. And um, he doesn't even write his books. I don't know if you guys know that, but he has a team of writers. And so they develop an idea, they send it to him. He finds a co-author, he co-authors the book with somebody, then that co-author oversees the team, and the team is actually who writes the books. So there's not, he's really never reading it. He like proofs it before it goes out and puts his name on it. But it's factory writing. It's genius as a business because he's making, I mean, so much money. But he's not writing books. And I think that's kind of sad. I mean, as, you know, a writer, the integrity... And that's not a secret, you guys. I mean, the, he does workshops of that, like, all over the internet. And you can find articles written by him by, about people that have, like, worked for him. And they've explained, like, what he does. And, I mean, it is genius, but it's... Who'd want to live that way, you know? Or not live that way, but who'd want to work that way as a writer. I mean, I like to write because I like to create stories. I don't want to sit in an office and edit somebody else. I mean, really, at that point, you're like an editor, you know? But, um, and maybe he has more control over it than, than that, than I know, but 
I heard he does that with almost all of his books. I mean, he constantly has new books out all the time. He's got young adult books. He's got children's books. He's got romances. He's got mysteries. I mean, he's got three different mystery series out at any given time. If you go to, like, Walmart or Meyer, there's always, like, five James Patterson books, like, on the new releases. And that is crazy. And he's saturated the market, and he's taken it over, and people love him, though, you know? <clears throat> and I think that, you know... The thing about reading is that reading is really about escape for me and really getting into a story and meeting new characters. I just was talking about this on a booktube video the other day. I think people should read what they want to read. I don't think you should ever be ashamed about what you read. I don't like, you know, okay, some people read great literature, classic literature, but I don't think that says anything more about you than somebody that doesn't, you know? Read what you want to read. Reading should be for fun. And it should be to, you know, if you read nonfiction, it should be to open your mind to new ideas and concepts and to educate. And I do listen, I mean, I do listen to some audiobooks that are nonfiction. I do read some audiobooks, or some, I do read some books that are nonfiction. Um, more like self-help stuff. I used to read a lot of memoirs, actually, back in the day. Well, that's not true. I just listened to Sam Lansky's The Gilded Razor, so that was a memoir. A little sad news today. I, I'm trying not to be sad about it. Um, we found a lump on Pee-Pee's like, chest. And it literally just showed up overnight. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen Pee-Pee in a lot of my videos. He has a horrible cough. And um, like a year and a half ago when we took them to get their shots, the vet at that time, it was a different vet than we go to now, she said that she was worried that maybe it was a heart murmur. And so this is not on the side of his heart, um, I don't think, but it really worries me. I was, of course, online reading all these articles about lumps on dogs. And I guess a lot of them are benign, but you have to get them in right away. So I'm gonna try to, I mean, we leave next you know, week, at the end of next week for Miami. And um, I'm trying to, I'm gonna try to get him into the vet tomorrow. Like, for, I'm gonna try to get him in the vet to the, into the vet on Monday morning. Because uh, I'm not going out of town and not knowing what's going on with my dog. I'm just not. And what's so sad about it is I was watching him tonight, like outside and just running around. And he's just such a happy dog. And he doesn't seem like there's anything physically wrong with him, you know? He does get caught up in these coughing spurts, so. It makes me worried about the little guy, so. And Alex immediately goes into this, you know, we should probably talk about what's going to happen if, like, we have to make some serious choices. I said, I'm not putting a dog down that is healthy. I'm just not going to do that. Um, I said I did that before because my dog was so aggressive. I mean, I had my last dog 11 years, and because he was... Alex couldn't move in with Pee, Pee because my other dog would have just killed him. I mean, literally would have killed him. I never even had my mom in my house in 11 years. She never once came into my house because she was so terrified of this dog. He bit my ex, sent my ex to the emergency room. I mean, it was horrible. And, but, I mean, I had to put him down at 11 years because I couldn't have a relationship. And so, and he couldn't be on a farm. The vet told us that. There's, you, this dog will attack other animals. He can't be on a farm. So, I mean... He couldn't be with an older person because he would have bitten an older person. He couldn't, like, put his food down. He would attack your hand. He was one of the most aggressive. I mean, our vet said he was one of the most aggressive dogs that anybody she had ever seen. And so, um, but I'm not putting a dog down that's, you know, not, um, that's not unhealthy. I mean, that's not in pain. I had this dog when I was growing up. I had a wire-haired fox terrier, and he lived to be about 16 and a half. And my mom um, really struggled with this. She had him put to sleep when, um, like, I had left and was living in my own apartment by this point. And this is, this is why I got my recovery dog, because I felt so bad, because I was in the middle of my addiction. And I never came over and saw him or anything. It was my childhood dog, you know? And I was so wrapped up in my own drinking and drugging that I just could care less. And my mom had called me like several times that month and was like, I think you need to come over and see him. I think you need to come over and see him. I'm really worried about him, blah, 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 whatever. He was bleeding in his mouth. He had like a cyst in his mouth and she didn't know what was going on. So 
uh, he got to the point where he couldn't walk on one of his legs, and so my mom would have to pick him up and carry him outside so he could go to the bathroom. And then she came downstairs one morning. We had this, like, uh, glassed-in porch off our house that was really just an extension of the house, like another room. It wasn't, like, screened in or anything like that. We just called it the porch, but it, like, just looked out over the woods and had all these windows that wrapped around it and this green carpet. But we had plants, like, on the floor, ferns and stuff. And my mom came down and he was like stuck in the fern and she didn't know how long he had been there. And um, she was so upset about it. And so she took him to the vet and I guess the vet told her, she said, he said, you have done everything humanly possible that you can to make this dog comfortable. He's not comfortable anymore. And so at that point my mom was okay with having him put down. But up till then she was like, I mean, She's like, I, I, I'm not a person that can do that to a living creature. I just don't feel right about that. And uh, and I'm very much the same way. I just, I can't do that. I can't judge whether or not, you know, PP's level of comfort and pain. But the dog plays with his little brothers. And, you know, he runs around all day long outside. I mean, he's running like crazy at 11 and a half. And, you know, he's, I don't know. He's just my best friend, you know, in the whole world. I can't imagine my life without him, and and that's going to not be a good day. And so Alex was like, Peter, like, we need to really think about this, like, financially what we can afford if we have to, like, have these really extensive surgeries. And I said, we'll figure it out. And he's like, okay, we cannot be ridiculous about this. We do not have $20,000 to spend on a dog. We just don't. And I'm like, Alex, and this is Alex's dog. And he, like, started, and, like, I walked out of the room, and I came back in, and Alex was, like, crying and holding pee, -pee and... And so we sat there and we talked about it and we were like, you know, I said, we're jumping to a lot of conclusions. First of all, we don't know. It may not be anything. It may just be a fatty cell, you know? And Alex is like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like if I have to put him down, you know? And I said, Alex, I said, we cannot go there yet, you know, with this. And, um, I spend about 80% of my time with those three dogs so when people talk about, like, their dogs being their children, I mean, my dogs are my children, but PB is my best friend. I mean, he's in every video that I make, even if you don't see him. He's sitting right down next to me, and, um, you know, we wake up every morning together, and sometimes Boo and Tucker sleep in their, you know, crate downstairs, and he always sleeps with me, and he always wakes me up and goes like this to my chest, you know, and and he talks and he goes mm, 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 stuff and he's been in my life for nine years you know I can't imagine him not being in my life and uh, I don't know this is a very, a very depressing vlog <clears throat> and I, I refuse to borrow trouble until I know what's going on because we may go to the vet and the vet will say everything is fine or we may go to the vet and the vet may say there's some things we need to do. We need to have surgery. Let's try this, whatever. So, and we're going to, we have decided that we will do <clears throat> whatever it takes. So, um, yeah. But then I feel guilty talking about, you know, how much money it's going to cost for all of this, possibly if it's something serious and we're going to Miami. It's like, okay, well, your dog's life is definitely more important than going to Miami. You know, should we, and so we're like, should we cancel the trip? I was like, Alex, let me take him to the vet on Monday. We'll figure this out. <laughs> but if you had a sick dog before, like I've had a sick dog before and you watch them very closely, you know? <clears throat> and so I was like, tonight I was like, do his eyes look glassy to you? And Alex is like, no. And I'm like, is he acting any different? And he's like, he's begging for my food. No, he's not acting any different. And then when I was outside tonight, I was like, pee pee. And he was like, <laughs> and then he like darted off. I mean, he's not acting any different, you know, but maybe he wouldn't. I don't know. So there was that. And then, so I'll keep you guys updated. There was that boo was like really attention seeking for me today. It was really weird. 
You know, it's interesting because we have three dogs and we have, I think, nine million toys. And Tucker is the only one that plays with toys. I don't know if maybe he's the only one that understands how to, well, Pee Pee will. Like, if Tucker is playing with a toy, Pee Pee will go take it away. But it's very that, you know? Like, Boo Radley doesn't, he, I don't think Boo Radley's ever picked up a toy. I don't think he knows what to do with it. Like, he like, gets excited when he goes like this, you know, when they're like running around and stuff and they're chasing, like if we throw balls, like Pee Pee and like we have these little tennis balls, Pee Pee and uh, Tucker will chase after them and get them and, you know, bring them up. But like Boo just kind of like, is like, what's going on? What's going on? He like doesn't get it, you know, like he doesn't understand the idea of playing. So I took a nap tonight after we ate and uh, we started watching that show, uh, Growing Up Supermodel. Stupid, 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 stupid. I won't be watching that show. <laughs> it was the dumbest show ever. So if you were thinking about watching it, don't. It's dumb. And, um, but you know whose daughter is on the show? Is Kelly LeBlanc. Do you remember her? Is that her name? Kelly LeBlanc, I think. From, there's always on this road that I drive frogs, big frogs that are jumping across the road. I just think that's so random in the middle of Indiana in August. Um, Kelly, Le, Kelly, is that her name? LeBrock, is that her, that's not her name. Kelly LeBrock and Steven Seagal's daughter is on there. And she's a plus size model. She's very pretty. Um, and she's probably the most genuine of all of them on there. Um, and then Beverly Peel's daughter is on there. Ricky Schroeder's two daughters are on there. I about died. I was like, oh my God, Alex is like, who is Ricky Schroeder? I go, who is Ricky Schroeder? I said, Lonesome Dove, Silver Spoons, Ricky Schroeder. Like, are we for real? The champ, the champ, Ricky Schroeder. Champ, champ. <laughs> Do you remember that movie? I bawled my eyes out. I think that was the first movie I ever really cried to, except for uh, Black Stallion. Was he in Black Stallion too? I don't know. But anyway, why do I associate those two movies together? I wonder if I went and saw like a double feature or something. And then I took a nap and Boo Radley, who is Mr. Attention Seeking of the World, followed me right up into the bedroom, even though Alex was downstairs with Tucker. <laughs> Tucker just lay, Tucker just like lays like this everywhere, you know? And um, he's like, he and PP are on the couch with Alex, and Alex was like uh, putting stuff up on our website. I should just call it Alex's website. He's the one that does all the work on it. I don't do anything on it anymore. And he was putting up these interviews and article stuff up there. And um, so anyway, um, Boo Radley followed me upstairs, and I like closed the door. And Alex, so we had this feather bed right underneath our old mattress, and it was like we had like a feather. It was just we had all this stuff. Well, the feather bed was like a very expensive feather bed. Do you guys know what feather beds are? Okay, so but it looks like a white, just like uh, down comforter is what it looks like. And then Alex has been using it. What is that? Oh my god. Oh my God. Oh my God, can you see? Oh. It was a mama raccoon and like four baby raccoons. It was so cute, you guys. I know you couldn't see it because she's like went right behind this tree. And as soon as they got across the road, she turned and looked back and he like, don't you come for my babies. As much as I love animals, you would think that I would have been a vegetarian a long time ago. And I will tell you this, okay? I feel so much better, and I have not had a hard time being a vegetarian. Like, I really haven't. But in my head, like, I constantly am thinking to myself, I can't do this forever. Like, I'm going to want chicken fingers, or I'm going to want nachos. You know what I mean? Like, that is in my head. Like, I'm already thinking, like, well, I'll give myself a break while, in my, while I'm in Miami. And I'm like... That is ridiculous. Like, you would think I would be able just to live that way, you know? Like, as much as I love animals, I mean, I just don't even feel right about it. But something switches off in my head. I don't know what it is. It's the weirdest thing, you know? Like, I'm, I'm very conscious about the choices that I make in my life. I really am. Like, 
it's not like I go in and I eat chicken fingers and I don't think to myself that I'm eating an animal. I know what I'm doing. I probably don't think about it at that moment, you know, like, because I just would maybe like to enjoy my meal, but I don't want to have to think about the processes that got me there. But maybe I should, you know, maybe that's what I need to be thinking about because, I mean, animals are such, a, you know, an endearing part of my life. They mean so much to me. Uh, I mean, I'm sitting here talking about my dog and frogs and raccoons and, you know, everything. Possums the other day. Is that your home, Mr. Possum? Somebody commented on my video and said that. Um, what was I talking about? Movies. Oh, so Boo Radley came up and uh, I closed the door. And so Alex has been sleeping with this big... Our bed, let me just tell you, we don't ever make our bed, okay? This was such a hard thing for me to get used to. If you're going to move in with somebody, let me tell you a little trick right now, okay? All those issues that you have of control, you need to just let them go, right? Because there are things that are important to them, and there are things that are important to you. And some of those things are not going to align, right? Like, just let them go. And one of them I had to let go was that I used to be the person, literally, literally, okay, up until nine years ago next week when we got together that I made my bed and I got up, I brushed, went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth, came back out and made my bed like a hotel room every day. My bed was made beautifully every day, right? Alex hates a made bed. He hates getting into a made bed. Even when we're like on vacation, he would prefer if we just like didn't even have the maid make our bed. And I'm like, that is so stupid. But I've had to let it go. You know, like it's just, he loves it. And so we basically have this huge bed with just like blankets and comforters everywhere and all kinds of pillows. And I have to say, it's very comfortable. Like I don't, I don't. I, it was so hard. It was so hard for me to get used to just getting into an unmade bed. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I mean, I literally used to fold my bed back and get into it. I mean, like, I all the whole nine yards, right? And I don't do that anymore. I used to be so structured, you guys. Listen, I drive around a car and listen to audiobooks and make videos now. And I write my books and I listen to crazy music and I'm traveling and going out to dinner with friends. And I feel like I have a really great life. But I never thought before that my life wasn't good when I was working in treatment. And, you know, it's interesting because I, um, I, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm, there's something I gotta say that's where my head went about another treatment program in a second. But, you know, like, I would get up every morning. This was my day. I w okay, so I had to be at the hospital at 8 o'clock in the morning. I worked 8 to 4.30. So, except for one night a week, I worked uh, 12 to 9.30. But I always stayed till 10 or 10.30. It was family night, so I had to stay late on family nights. But I worked 8 to 4.30. Okay, so, legit. The night before, I would eat my dinner. Um, when my ex and I were together, we would get fast food or whatever. We ate a lot of fast food or brought stuff home or went out to dinner. And uh, <clears throat> we love Chinese buffet. Where am I at on time? Okay. And um, I guess this went a little bit longer than I thought it would, huh? But anyway, imagine that. And uh, we would like eat dinner and then we would come home and we would watch TV shows. And we this is before Netflix. And we would buy like seasons of shows like um, uh, America's Next Top Model, Lost, things like that. And we would eat and then I would iron my clothes for the next day because every day I had to be business casual, which was like khakis and a polo shirt. And that's what I wore literally every day. If you like any of the kids I used to work with, if you'd be like, well, what did Peter wear when you, he was your counselor? They'd say khakis and a polo shirt every day, every day. And uh, except for like, we would always have like one jeans day where you had to wear a cold shirt, but I never wore a cold shirt because I'm not a cold fan. And I think that stuff's corny. Um, I used to always wear, this was when I was thinner, I just remember this, I don't know why, but those boot cut Abercrombie and Fitch jeans. Abercrombie and Fitch jeans were like the only ones that ever fit me. Because I'm five foot ten and a half, I'm not tall, but my legs are long, and so like, anyway, um, I'm kind of high-waisted, if that makes sense. So, uh, I would, okay, so the night before, I would iron my clothes, 
Um, and then he and I would watch some TV show and while we were eating or whatever, like, I think he usually got home later because he's a hairstylist. And so I would do that stuff before I came home and then like we would do that and then we would like get into bed and then we would like, you know, go to sleep and that was what we would do. And um, then we both went to bed about the same time and um, because I had to be up so early and I would get up at about 6.30, 6.45 in the morning. I never ate breakfast. I've never been, I love breakfast food, but I've never been a breakfast eater, if that makes any sense. And um, I must have got up more like seven o'clock. I would get up at seven o'clock and I took a shower every morning. <laughs> no hat for me back in those days. And I would, you know, did my hair every day. Oh my God, everybody always taught me my hair was so cute. I mean, my hair, listen, okay. I colored my hair from 23 on because my hair went this color at like 23. But the texture of my hair has changed a lot in the last couple years. And my hair used to be like, I would get out of the shower and it would just stand straight up. So I had a faux hawk like for years. And uh, remember those faux hawks? And um, I mean, I could just put stuff in it. It was just real messy. And everybody, be, they, oh, they thought it was so cute. So anyway, but um, I would, you know, get dressed, do my hair. And I would go to work and I would stop on the way and I, I mean, we, this was before Starbucks or I don't, I think it was before Starbucks. I don't remember going to Starbucks, but anyway, I would always stop at the gas station. Oh, because I get the paper to do the crossword because I did the crossword every morning and I would do, get the paper and I would get a cup of coffee and I was always at the hospital by 745. And then my like supervisor and the other counselor, because they worked a little, they worked till five, they would come in at 830. So I would go in, one of the things I did, here's a little trick for you if you wanna be real efficient where you work, is that I kept a legal pad every day. And so on the first page of the legal pad, um, I would write a list of everything that I had to do that day that did not specifically have to do with my patients. So like if I had a clinical meeting, I would put clinical meeting two o'clock and then I would put like, uh, you know, like uh, CPR training four o'clock, you know what I mean, things like that. And I would put everything I had to put on that page, right? And then on the next page, I had each of my patients' names listed. So like Judy Smith, underlined, call parents, set up family session, call probation officer, group therapy note. And I was like itemized, okay? Every year in my review, my supervisor always said to me that she could not believe how much stuff I actually got done and that I was that efficient. I am still a note taker today and I, I highly, highly believe in keeping notes. So anyway, and I would put like specifically, like even though these kids had group group therapy every day and I had to put a do a group note on them every day I would still write group note on them right and then I would go through well I had a yellow highlighter and then I had um, a black pen that I would this sharpie pen you know those sharpie pens I love them like ink pens those were what I used and then I know you guys are like why would we care about this well I'm just telling you about my old life because it's kind of funny to me sometimes this is the life that I lived and then I would, this yellow Sharpie, whenever I completed something, I would highlight it through. I've talked about this maybe on here before. Well, where are we at on time? Let me stop this real quick so I can start it again. Okay, no, I didn't forget this time because I started it right again. So then what I would do is, at the end of the day, oh, so then I would like, when I came in, the night before, whatever I didn't get done on the list, I would make my list for the next day, the night before. So when I came in, I had one of those big calendars. You guys know those calendars I'm talking about? Those big white calendars that sit on your desk. I had one of those. And then right in the center of it, I mean, I was organized, baby, organized, okay? And I didn't use my highlight lights in my, uh, lights in my office. I had this little, like, Japanese light that I have in my office now. And uh, I had this tapestry on the wall. The kids love to just come in there and sit and just talk for hours and stuff. But anyway... So I would like right in the center, I would put my notepad of all the things I would do in the morning. So I would come in the morning, I would check my voicemails, whatever I had to do, I would add, if I had to call somebody back, I would add that to my list. I would check my emails, add that to my list, answer any emails. And by eight o'clock, I was completely caught up and ready for my day to start. And group therapy didn't start till nine. My supervisor didn't get, till, get there until 8.30. We always would have this morning meeting between the counselors and the supervisor from 8.30 to 8.45 to nine, and then go into group therapy. So I would 
sit there from 8, 8 to 8.30 waiting for everybody to come in, sitting there talking to the kids who were coming back from breakfast, and they, then they would have school for an hour, and I was doing the crossword, sitting there in the nurse's station doing the crossword every morning. Now, can you believe that shit? Me. Okay, baby? I was up, showered, dressed, hair looking on point, okay? List caught up, emails answered, phone calls responded to, sitting there doing a crossword, drinking my cup of coffee at 8 o'clock in the morning. And that is some craziness to me. I can't believe I used to live like that. I really can't. And loved it. Loved every minute of it. Loved the structure. I was so obsessed with having... Spilled water everywhere. I was so obsessed with having that kind of structure in my life. I really, really liked it. And if you work in an organization, I really suggest you keep a list like that. I mean, lists like that are really help people be efficient. I can't tell you how many people I try to train with those lists. And they would be like, I don't know what to put on the list. I'm like family session. You write it down. When you finish it, you highlight it. It's just not that deep. But anyway, I still do that today. Now I have 15 notebooks and I can't keep track of all my different notebooks. Right now, true story in our kitchen counter, somebody sent me these post-it notes and they're real skinny thin ones and I'm obsessed. Whoever you are that sent those to me, I think it might have been Carrie. Whoever sent them to me, thank you. I love those things. I love post-it notes. Of any Post-it notes and Sharpies. Send them to me all day long. Sharpie, a uh, all this kind of stuff. Listen, baby, we ain't making any kind of money on YouTube anymore. And I was just talking to somebody. Somebody just sent me this long message about Patreon. And I talked about Patreon the other night. And somebody said, please, Peter, don't send me a Patreon. You can send me all the Sharpies you want, gift cards, whatever. Listen, I am open. I am open to all of it right now. I cannot start a Patreon because I've said so much shade about it. And I'm just not going to anyway. But feel free to send me a, you know, I don't know, a Sharpie pen if you're out at the dollar store and you see one for a dollar, but, <laughs> or a postcard for a bookmark. Anyway, I, um, I used to love all that stuff. You know, I used to love living by the structure and then I would come home and then like I would let the dog out and I always took a nap. Like that was like, I would take it, I was in bed taking a nap by five o'clock and I would sleep from like five to six thirty. And then my ex would come home. And then on the weekends, uh, we both, because we both worked Tuesday through Saturday, because he was a hairstylist. Excuse me. And Saturday nights, um, Saturday night, Sunday night. Yeah, Saturday nights, we would typically, this is going to really show, okay? So we were both, like, Alex doesn't like to gamble. My ex and I loved to gamble. Loved it. Every minute of it. I don't know where this video was going earlier, but it ain't going there now. This is going into my old life, describing what my life used to look like. So, I hope you guys enjoy this. I'm sorry if you don't. Um, I was going to talk about social anxiety tonight because somebody asked me to talk about that in my You Now stream, but I'll do that tomorrow. Um, it's kind of fun for me to, you know, live memory road a little bit with my job and everything like that. I miss it. Oh, this is what I was going to say on a side note. Today, in the mail, it was so random, you guys. I, I never, like, nobody approaches me, like, from organizations to come and work, right? Which is really interesting to me because for a very long period of time, I was considered um, an addictions expert in Indiana. And, um... I mean, I used to get the weirdest calls from people all over the country, you know, that like treatment center setting them up and that we really want to know what you think about this and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we heard your name at a conference and blah, 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 blah. So I got this thing in the mail today. It was from a treatment center. It was like a personal letter from the CEO. Um, and it's not a city close to me in Indiana, but it could be a driving distance. I mean, if I wanted to drive it every morning, like offering me a position for a very good salary and I was like um I don't think so but I'm gonna put this in the drawer because I'm gonna remember this because I might want to do that like that I might and then it just like it triggered all these memories of me working in treatment I thought god I, maybe I would like to go back and do that again you know like I miss it some days honestly I don't miss the getting up in the mornings and getting dressed and all that stuff and I think honest to god if I had to do that that would be really really hard for me but I miss all that you know I miss working in a treatment facility and it wouldn't be in the capacity that I was doing before. Now, that would be the hard thing for me, that um, it wouldn't be, I mean, this was a personal letter, you guys. Okay, it wouldn't be in, the, and I, I'm like, why did you not just pick up the phone and call me, which I thought was interesting, but it wouldn't be in the, it would be more of an administrative role and um, like a program planning role, which I would love that as well, um, but only if I got to interact, and it is with kids, it, only if I got to interact with working with adolescents with drug problems again. That's where my heart is. That or women that are coming out of prison. But I will tell you what's really interesting is whenever I get approached 
typically by men in 12-step programs to work with them <clears throat> as a sponsor, it is always the roughest of the rough, okay? It is always the guy with 9 million tats, not passing judgment, I'm just describing him, that has been to prison and just got out. They always seek me out. I don't know what it is about me, but like, they're always the ones that are like, and they always just come up to me so sheepishly, and I'm like, hey, what's going on? Can I help you? And they're like, uh, do you sponsor? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And they're like, can I get your number? And I'm like, absolutely. And then they're like, uh, it's really hard for me to talk to somebody, but I, I'm supposed to get a sponsor. I'm like, that's cool. Yeah, like, here's my number. Call me. And they always do, you know? And it's so interesting working with these guys because I think what they realize is, you know, gay, straight, tattoos, no tattoos, backgrounds that are different, sober for 22 years, just getting sober. Physically, we look different. You know, all of that. You know, they're more masculine than I am and all of that kind of stuff. We're, we're just people, you know? And they see that, I think, in kind of the communication that we have. And that's an awesome thing about 12-step programs. I love that. You know, I love that so much. And so I've been thinking about that today and I thought, God, like I got even kind of teary-eyed thinking about all the families and all the kids I've worked with through the years, you know, and I love what I do, you know, and I, and I, and I, God, what? The last couple of videos, some people have really criticized me for crying on my videos, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I say I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry, you know, I'm just, I'm a crier, and I feel things, but like, um, I love what I do, and I say on here a lot that I'm trying to, you know, like, I would love for YouTube to make, be my full-time career. I'm trying to make that happen. I'm really working hard that maybe eventually that can happen very soon. That would be my dream. That I could write full-time and make videos full-time. I'm working towards that. And I need to just put that out there because that's my truth, is that I am. I'm trying to make this my full-time career, whatever that means for me. I don't have the kind of subs right now that I can do that, but maybe eventually, you know, within the next six months or a year. But, um... But I know if I do that, like, I won't ever go back and working in direct care. Like, that will be the, that will be the closing of the door to that. I mean, I always could, but I know I won't. And, um... There was a period of my life that that was so important to me. That I, uh... You know, I thought I would do it until I was 65 and I would retire. You know, I didn't think that I would open a private practice and be, boom, be full in a month, you know, with 30 clients a week. I thought I'd see maybe five to 10 people a week and work in a treatment facility. And um, that wasn't ha what happened. You know, I thought I'd come and visit my mom in her condo and she'd be 85 and we'd talk about, you know, old movies and like still work in treatment and Maybe sit on a few boards. And maybe really make a difference, you know? And I do think I did. I do I really do think that I made a difference in, you know, quite a few people's lives. And I'm not I don't mean that arrogantly and prideful. I, I really do think I did. And um and I'm proud of the work that I did. And I'm proud of the work that we did as a team working together back then. We would walk into conferences together. And people would look at us like we were the dream team of counseling. It was so cool, you know. It was just so cool that people like looked at us like this innovative treatment team, you know. And we were all, you know, late 20s, early 30s at that time. And here's this innovative treatment team that, you know, is like doing such different things and getting on kids' levels and really understanding kids. And they're not coming from a clinical point of view. And it's all changed where I work now. It's all clinical. It's all, they've, they've lost all of that. And it makes me sad and I'm glad I'm not there anymore. But, you know, it's like... We did some really powerful work. We did some really good work. And um, we met a lot of really cool people. And I met a lot of really cool kids. Some of them never grew up and became adults. Some of them passed away before that 
ever had that chance. A lot of them did grow up to become adults, and a lot of them are very cool adults, and a lot of them are adults that are still making the same choices that they were when they were teenagers, and it makes me sad. One of the things that's hardest for me is when I go to 12-step meetings and I see kids that I had as patients 15 years ago, and they're no better now. In fact, they're worse than they were then. And they're still like, and they're like, hey, Peter, Peter, you know, like, hey, remember that one time in group therapy? And I'm like, and it's fun, and it's fun to talk to them about that. But it's like at the same time, I want to shake them and go, it's been 15 years. You've missed out on a lot, dude. Come on, you know? It, it really makes me sad. And, um, and then I have other people, like, you know, that some of which have come into my live streams and I've made vlogs with that I think are just phenomenal young adults today, you know? And, uh, I say that and they're my husband's age, which is crazy. But, um, you know, there is nothing like working in a treatment facility or a psych facility or a school. I mean, I loved working in an elementary school. That was the same thing every day, something different. Every day it was something different, you know? And I was actually thinking about this earlier because um, I was watching a certain YouTuber who I feel like is doing anything they possibly can to get noticed, no matter how reckless and dangerous they are and what, how dangerous their language is that they use and the words that they use and the things they say. And they just are like, I don't care. And, you know, you're going to, you're going to watch me. And, and they are growing and they are getting more views and they are getting good subs, you know? And then I look at myself when I was that same person's age and I think about the fact that like, you know, I was going to work every day and listening to histories of horrible abuse and generational addiction and teen pregnancy and gang warfare. Not just some kids in the suburbs throwing signs, but real gang warfare, you know? And kids coming from places that were so scary that they didn't think they were ever going to get out of them, you know? And not just because they were poor, because I worked with quite a few kids that had a lot of money, and their environments were just as scary, too. And, uh... But there was so much fun with it, too, you know? Like, I'll never forget, like, every year, we would, uh... On Halloween, we would decorate the unit. The kids would decorate the unit. So the unit was just one big hall, right? And you would come down and it was one, two, three. The school room was the first room and then the girls' lounge and then two bedrooms on one side. So that's four girls on one side. And then one, two, three. One, three girl, three rooms on the other side. So that would be six. Yeah, so 10 girls on one side. <clears throat> and then boys, okay, then you have the nurse's station, the lounge, group rooms on either side, <clears throat> and then our offices and group rooms, and then, um, so like my office, and then another counselor's office, and then group room, and then other side, supervisor's office, other office, group room, and then, um, I just remember when I got, I just remembered when I got my office with the window and I was so excited. Like that was like, I lived for that day. But do you ever have that moment? You ever had that moment when you wanted the office with the window, you couldn't wait. And I would just sit out there and drink coffee and I would watch it snow and I'd be like, oh, it's gonna be hard to get home. God, see, it's just those simple things. Those simple things, they mean so much in life. We act like they don't, but those are sometimes the most meaningful things of all. Those moments like that, of me sitting in my office at three o'clock and it's starting to snow and everybody going, should we leave early? Do you think it's we're gonna be able to make it home safe? The roads are supposed to be really bad. I'm sitting there drinking a cup of coffee knowing I live 10 minutes away and there's no way I'll probably be able to make it in the next day. You know what I mean? Like those moments. So anyway, we would decorate the whole unit for Halloween and the boys rooms were at the very end with their lounge. And, uh, then the kids would go trick or they had to dress up and they would go <laughs> trick or treating through the whole hospital. And I remember this one girl, she like made out of like, uh, <laughs> the pay, like 
this huge white paper and then she made this orange cap and she was a drug screen bottle. You know, like that you urinate in. And I mean, it just was fun. We always had such fun stuff that we did. And you know, every Christmas we would come in and when they were asleep late at night, we would put presents and little Christmas trees um, in their rooms. So they could have Christmas. And a lot of these kids didn't have parents or families that ever came to visit them. And a lot of them did. I mean, the majority of them had families that came to visit them. But I had kids that were there two years and never had a family member, you know? I miss those kids. And, like, it's hard because, like, forever in my head, they'll always be 15 or 16, you know? You'd think I would run into more parents. I haven't, like, in forever. <laughs> So anyway, it triggered a lot of memories for me today when I got that letter in the mail. I thought, is this like a sign? Should I be working in treatment center again? You know, in the treatment center again? But I don't think that's what it means. <laughs> and I do think that especially working with teenagers, younger people need to work with teenagers. And if you're older and you're a school teacher and you're a counselor, I know you're probably coming for me, but I do think kids relate to people that are younger, and I just, you know, at 36, I aged out. It was like, it was time for me to either be an administrative role, which I didn't want to do, and let the younger counselors do their deal, or move on, you know, like, go home every day with new bands I had to listen to because these kids would tell me about all these different bands I had to listen to. When I started there, you know, that was back in the days of like, um, like rap was just like really big, but, um, like <sighs> Insane Clown Posse, uh, a lot of those kids wore those big pants and <laughs> had all that stuff. Oh, God. The food there was really good. We had really good food there, though. We had a great salad bar. I just remember the food. That was so weird. Anyway. Memories, right? But life changes, and you have to constantly recreate yourself. <coughs> and, you know, in two years, I'll be looking back on this moment, and I'll be crying in a car, probably, talking about what I didn't know in that first year you know, of having my channel up and how naive I was and how cool that was and how innocent that experience was of me just having four channels and making videos and how different it is now and now I'm doing, you know what I mean? Like, life constantly changes and evolves. And you have to evolve with it. You have to. You just have to because there's, listen, you can't just sit in one space for the rest of your life. You can. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, I have friends of mine that have grown up, lived in the same town their entire life, and will probably never move, and a lot of them lived in the same house. And there is nothing wrong with that, and to me, there's something very appealing about that simple life. I like that. I don't like change, and it feels very safe to me, right? But aren't you missing out on a lot in life, you know? It's like my Darlene story. Go at least see Paris and see if you like it. You know what I mean? I mean, I do think that we have to bust outside of our comfort zones and try some new things. And the fact of the matter is, is that when I got out of treatment, my goal was that someday I wanted to be a counselor. And then my goal was I wanted to be the best counselor. And then the next goal that I wanted to be was that I wanted to be in private practice. And you know, I was a pretty good counselor. I was a counselor and I had my own private practice. And so I achieved all three of my goals. And I'm really proud of myself for that. And it's time to move on, you know? And I think, like, right now, why I've been so emotional in the last couple months is because I'm really trying to figure out, like, what do I want the next part of my life to look like, you know? Like, what do I really want it to look like? What I really like it to look like is I would like YouTube to be my full-time career, and I would like to write full-time. I would like to completely live in my creative passion. Because when I am in my creative passion, I am the happiest. And, um... It's just figuring out how to make that work, you know? But I will. I'll make it work. I'm not big on walls telling me what I can do, you know? I'm big on trying to figure out how to get over those walls and how to have this life that I want to have. This video that I told y'all was going to be short ended up being 50 plus minutes. So I'm going to get off here now, you guys, okay? Dream big. 
what's the next part of your life gonna look like? We gotta figure that out, okay, together. We can accomplish all of that. I mean, we're the wolf pack. I love you, bye.